Greetings, Hurley Burleyites. During this pandemic, it's pretty safe to say we've learned a lot about ourselves. Personally, I've learned that I can survive without haircuts, but not without styling gel. And I think we've all learned just how critically important it is to have reliable and fast mobile communications. So I'm happy to say that very recently, our presenting sponsor, TELUS, was awarded fastest mobile network in Canada for the sixth consecutive time and best mobile coverage for the third consecutive time by Seattle-based Utla, the global leader in internet metrics. TELUS is rightfully proud of their world-leading network, and that kind of performance has helped achieve some really critical outcomes during the pandemic for so many Canadians, whether it's helping remote First Nations communities stay safe and connected, or supporting distance learning by extending their Internet for Good program to students during COVID-19, or by providing technology and volunteers to the Operation Enfant Soleil Telethon. TELUS has always been committed to their communities, and they continue to use their technology, resources, and network to address some of our most important social issues. To read about these stories and learn more, go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. Okay, let's get to it, faithful Hurley Burleyites. We appreciate you choosing to spend some quality pandemic time with us, and we've got another two-part podcast for you today with a topic in part one that couldn't be more timely or relevant. We have Liz Stewart on the show with us. Liz is the president of the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association. She taught for more than 20 years before joining the labor movement. She brings a breadth of teacher and political activism to the job and is known for keeping the membership at the heart of everything that she does. So we're gonna tackle the issue that's on so many people's minds. How do we get children back to school in September? Should we be getting children back to school in September? How do we make it safe? for school to open in September. What do we need to do to make it so? For part two, we'll bring on our political panel, the indomitable Jenny Byrne, and guesting with us again this week, Chris Ball. We'll pick up on getting our kids back to school, plus we'll talk about what else but we. We, big week of testimony last week at the House of Commons, Mr. Trudeau for hours, the Kielbergers before him, Katie Telford after him, Big, big week in the week controversy. How did everybody handle themselves throughout it? Where is this issue going? Jenny will have some thoughts on this, I presume. And Chris may, Chris, we'll see if Chris and the NDP can rise to, uh, rise to Jenny's bait. Anyway, after that, we'll also talk about the economy. And uh, in a post-COVID world or in a middle of COVID world, whatever it is. But we're pretty interested in what impact the economy is going to have on politics going forward. So we'll come back to that with the panel. But to start with, we're here with Liz Stewart. Hi, Liz. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm just great. When I ask how are you, I mean it in the broader sense than just <laughs> that you have had your cup of coffee Oh, you're not just morning. being polite? I mean, oh, okay. No. Uh, we're five months well, into I, a I'm... pandemic. How are you? Uh, I'm frustrated. Um irritated um a little overwhelmed i think because i, I know you know I, as you know we we had a it, it's been a it was a heck of a school year last year so um you know we had our members out on picket lines um so you know members of of our affiliate lost you know four days of pay last year i did not receive as many uh, communications, contacts from members as I have about returning to school in September. Um, they are extremely concerned um, and anxious and frustrated and all of the things that I too am. So in reality, that's how I am. Right? Just incredibly frustrated. All right. Okay, so let me give you just a little bit of my background, which is that I come from a family of Catholic school teachers. My mother was a Catholic school teacher. My two aunts and an uncle were Catholic school teachers. I've got cousins littered throughout the uh, throughout the the system. So, and I myself uh, <clears throat> am the virtuous person I am because of my twelve years of Catholic education, and. So that's my background, but let me just be clear with you. You are the president of the Catholic Teachers. Is there any light between you and the other teachers' unions on this issue of going back to school, or can I kind of assume that you're generally speaking on behalf of teachers, not just the Catholic Teachers? Well, I mean, 
I have to, I'll make the, uh, the political statement first, which is I can only speak on behalf of the Catholic teachers of this province, but I can say quite confidently that no, we are, we are all in the same situation at this point in time. We were all lined up together. Um, you know, as you know, we, we did a joint press, co- um, press release. We have, uh, we did a, a advertisement, um, in newspapers together, all of us. Um, uh, and, you know, it, because we all are getting the same concerns, we all share the same frustration um, because our members are all going to be back working in those schools. And, you know, some of, you know, my, my sister affiliates represent more than just teachers, right? So, so they're thinking about, I mean, we all think about all education workers, but, you know, they, they have a responsibility to advocate for, for all education workers as well. And so, you know, we all feel the same way and we all have the same concerns and fears, quite frankly, right? I mean, the, there's some real trepidation about what this can look like. But I, I think, and I keep using the word frustrated because it, it just encaptures how we feel. When, when we got, I mean, the day they announced they were closing schools was the same day that um, OECTA managed to get its provincial agreement in place. So for what for us was supposed to be a day where all of our members went, oh, thank goodness, you know, that's done. Um, it became, a, okay, so we've done that. Now we have to focus on this. And we started asking then, how are we going to reopen? Because whether it was a week, two weeks, a month, six months, eventually schools were going to reopen. And so we have been asking and asking and asking. And now five weeks before school, everybody's scrambling and it's just unconscionable, right? Like it should never have happened because we actually should have pre-planned and maybe it's the teacher in me because we do like to be planned. And, you know, if you've got all those family members, you'll know everything is always highly organized, right? Because we like good plans. We like to know what's coming next and we like to make sure that we've planned for all contingencies because that's what teaching is. Nothing ever goes according to what you had written in your little book that day. So you've always got backup plans going. And we knew that would be the case, but we should have started doing it months ago. And so the politically correct and the polite way of putting it is frustrating because we haven't done that. That didn't happen. And now we've got five weeks. I just want to take you back for a second because I want to understand a little bit about who you are before we get deeply into this. Okay. What attracted you to teaching in the first place? That is a really good question because if you had asked me when I left school before I started on my uh, on my college education, I would have said, no, nah, I'm never going to be a teacher. It was not something that was on my radar um, and I had actually thought about um, moving to the States and working with uh, developmentally delayed adults was my master plan when I was 18. And uh, my mother... Cause and there's time, more of those in the States? Well, I, it was just I, I had been working <laughs> on a summer camp there, right, that, that worked with no, developmentally okay. adults. So that's why. But um, my mother, in her wisdom, because I was living in the UK at the time... Um, urged me to go and speak to my old headmaster at my old high school. And she said, oh, you know, he'll be able to help you, you know, decide where you want to go next. So I did. And he actually urged me to, to go and, and, and get into teaching. And so I agreed to do it because uh, the program I was getting into um, specialized in special education. So I figured it would get me where I wanted to go anyway. Um, but once I left school and moved to Canada and started teaching, I realized I love to, I do love teaching. I love the classroom. Um, it's difficult not being in a classroom, but, um, I, I just, you know, I, I always say you, you get this real sense of energy and joy from kids. I mean, not every day is joyful as a teacher, right? <laughs> like some are extremely stressful, but there are those moments and those are the ones you live for because you only need, even if you only have one a week, because sometimes that's all you get in some years right. are not great, but that's right. enough, right? Like you really feel like you feed off that. So it's, um, it's not the career I would have said I would, I'd have ended up into. No one in my family is in education. Um, 
but it's one that I'm, I'm quite passionate about. And I found that I loved. And now I have, you know, my niece back in England, she's um, planning to become a teacher because they listen to me go on and on and on about just what an amazing job it is. Cause it is right. Right. Yeah, it can be a very, very rewarding work. It also, though, is incredibly demanding work. Yes. And, you know, dealing with 35 people like me, um, <laughs> you know, I can, th I can think of things that, uh, you know, might be easier to do in life. But part um, of the fun of teaching is yeah? you never know what you're going to get, right? Like, and you never know how a day's going to go. And some of the most trying situations that you deal with can also be some of the most rewarding that you deal with. Some of the most trying students <laughs> that you deal with can <laughs> oftentimes be the most rewarding students that you deal with because, you know, a teacher may have to be firm and, um, you know, fairly rigorous within a classroom. But that doesn't mean to say they don't leave the room and laugh, right? I mean, we all <laughs> recognize kids are kids and they'll, they'll do and say things that, you know, first of all, especially younger children, they're pretty honest. So, you know, they'll, they'll say things that, you know, you, you can't smile at at the time, but you certainly can when you leave the room, right? Because they're not wrong. <laughs> like sometimes they're right. just not wrong. They just maybe shouldn't have put it the way they did, right? So it's a, you know, it's a one great the, <clears throat> One of the most touching moments I had with my mother in her last years <clears throat> was um, one evening she asked me to pull out my iPad, which enormously frustrated her that I would sit there at, when I was supposed to be visiting with her and look at my iPad and... One night she asked me to pull out my iPad and she asked me to start looking up people that she had taught 30 and 40 years ago. Look them up on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever I could find them to show her a current picture of them and find out what they were doing. And she was rhyming off these names of kids that she had taught in the 70s and curious about what had happened to them and what ended up with. I realized at that point what an impression those children had made on her. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. You, they do. They all have a special place in your heart, right? They just do. And it's important that they do well, which is why I think, you know, they talk about teaching as a vocation because it is, right? Like it's, it's the, you have all of a sudden, I mean, I, I'm a parent, I have two children. But when I would walk into a classroom, all of a sudden I would have, you know, 30 children because I recognize I'm looking after somebody else's baby. And I don't care if that child is three or 18, it's somebody's baby. And, you know, we all know we're not particularly rational when it comes to our own babies, right? Like we tend to be a little protective and a little, so that's my job, right? Every day is to care for that and to care for those those little individuals and to treat them as I would my own, which sometimes means they don't like me particularly much. But, you know, if, if I'm going to come from that place of caring and love, which is what I think, you know, the vast majority of teachers across this province do, then, yeah, sometimes it's tough love, right? Like, but, you right. know, it, it's that genuine caring that genuine desire that genuine passion to do the best you can for students and some years you hit the mark and you know you do and some years you don't right I mean we all have that too you have some years where it was just too difficult because there were just too many different factors in place but I know everybody tries every day okay so bearing all that in mind how important do you think it is that we go back to school this September full time. I I think you know it, I know that you know if I were in a classroom right now, and I certainly know from what I've heard from my members, they understand how critical it is that kids are back in the schools. Like they they really do because they know what an important link schools are. They know um, how important we are to the community. Um, so they recognize that, you know, we need to do that, but we need to do it so that A, it's sustainable because there's no point in, in throwing open the doors and saying we're ready because we're not, 
being open isn't being ready um, because we'll just have to close them again. So what we should be doing is, is looking at possibly a phased in opening if we cannot provide the funding and if this government cannot provide the funding to do it properly and to do it so that we have smaller class sizes so that we can make sure there's adequate cleaning. So school boards, although with five weeks to go, I recognize is difficult, can make sure that they have adequate ventilation so they can start getting all of those things checked and done properly, which quite frankly, they can't with the funds they have right now. Not even with this, you know, monies that the government's uh, just assigned to them, because quite frankly, doing that five weeks before is, is just not reasonable. You know, we should have had this right. plan in place months ago. And I think we need to look at how can we do this in a, in a safe manner there are things we can do. We can look at staggering entries. We can just, look just wait. At, I want to get into know, that. In a, I want to yeah. get into that in a sec, if I could, Liz. But mm -hmm. but before that, and I, I'm not setting you up. I just want to get this your opinion as a professional in this area. I tend to think about not about school not opening. I'll be honest with you. I tend to think about it from the parents' perspective. How does life? How can you carry on your life? How can you uh, do your job and? all that kind of stuff if kids don't go back to school. I tend to think about it from that perspective. What is the impact on children if they're not at school? Like they weren't at school for a number of months in this past year. If they didn't go back in September, do there start to be ramifications, either educational or emotional, on children? So um, I'm going to say, like, I'll take the academic piece first. Um, because I don't, I don't believe that, you know, those gaps will be huge. And I think teachers will work to mitigate those. So I don't worry about an academic gap, you know, and about that educational standpoint. Um, you know, kids are resilient. Teachers are innovative. Um, we will find a way. We're, we're going to have to work within the curriculum, but we can find a way and we'll fill those gaps. So kids, kids will be fine in terms of their academics. I don't think we need to worry that because they missed, you know, six months or whatever of grade six that they're not going to get into, you know, U of T, right? Like, I, I don't think we need to, to really stress about that. Okay. Um, right. I, I think certainly for our grade 11 and 12 students, it's a different kind of pressure and there's a, a different onus there. Uh, but again, it's something that, that teachers will work with those students and we'll, we'll find a pathway through. So that I don't worry about too much. Um, I think every teacher in the province, in fact, I know teachers across Canada um, because the CTF uh, recently did a, a survey um, of teachers all across Canada, as we had done as a, an affiliate as well. And, you know, they found that over 90% of the teachers were saying they were really concerned about students and about what you know the what was going to happen when students returned to school because of the fact they'd been out for so long because of the anxieties that we all know are going to be walking back through those doors and we also know that schools for for many students are the safe place in their lives you know this was where they would come to feel safe and secure every day and that was removed from them for a period of time so those we have some real concerns about. You know, how do we make sure we have adequate support in place, um, given that we know the types of stresses and anxieties are going to be walking back through the doors, not just, frankly, with the students, but with the, the other educational workers as well, with all of us as we walk back into schools, but specifically around students and their needs. Um, it is far better for students to be in school and no one is going to say otherwise because absolutely for their social emotional health it is better that we try and get them back into schools but it's also better that we get them back into schools where they have stability we don't want to have them all come back and then say oops everyone has to go home again because that truly is not good so let's try and make sure we do it in a way where we have that stability and they can have that security because quite frankly, it was yanked away from them uh, for good reason. But that's how the, you know, the, the response you'll get. So we don't want to have to do that again. We want to make sure it's done properly. We want to make sure it's done safely. Okay. So what would a safe opening look like? What are the el key elements of a safe opening? 
Well, I mean, I, I think we need to look at making sure there's um, enough social distancing space. So, you know, we need to look at uh, lowering class sizes so that we can ensure that. And that's not just so that I can feel safe as a teacher as I teach in front of these students. It's also because you cannot take um, a room full of six-year-olds and say, You've had to spend, you know, months, two meters apart from people that are not your immediate family. You've had to wear a mask if you want to go to the mall or you want to go to the store. But now we're going to throw you in a room with 20 other individuals and say, it's all off. Don't worry about it. Like that in and of itself will create some anxieties among students. So we, we need to make sure they come back in and feel safe. And we do that by you know, making sure there's the, the arrows in the school hallways, by making sure they know how to keep the, that distancing in place, by making sure there's not as many people crammed in a room. We, we do it by, you know, hopefully ensuring they have masks that they can wear, right, so that students are, can be kept safe. We make sure that schools are cleaned. Um, because quite frankly, you know, our custodial staff have been absolutely stretched to the max for years because that is where school boards cut because they want to try and keep a program running so they'll cut in plant and they'll cut in maintenance and now all of those chickens are coming home to roost right now all of a sudden all the gaps in infrastructure are, are very readily apparent to everybody so we have to find a way to to fill those gaps as well there's a lot that so practically to given given that schools years. exist and they're sorry about that liz Given that okay. schools exist and that they're finite in size, how do you, what, what's a proposal for increasing class sizes? I mean, I know I've heard people talk both in this context and in the childcare context about all the open space that's available right now. But are you expecting that we would be leasing or new buildings and, and to house kids in, getting them out of the actual physical building that they would normally be going to school in? There, there may be that. That may need to happen because, you know, I, I know there are high schools all across the province where they, you know, they're, they're already at max. They've got 1,500 or more students in them. So how do we make right. sure that we can, we can, you know, break those students up and put them into to multiple classrooms and make sure that there's smaller numbers? So, you know, we recognize that that's going to be an issue. Um, there are many schools around the province, though, that have extra space within them. I mean, we, we've had schools where they've closed down whole wings because, you know, to save money, school boards would mothball them. Well, it's time to open those back up and get them cleaned and get them up and running and move students into those so that we can start really, you know, spreading the kids out. It may be that we have to look at the community and say, are there places that we can utilize where we can have classes? You know, I, I know one of the propositions was taking gymnasiums, and but you know, not not the best case scenario. Having had to teach in a gym once or twice, but you know, it's it's not a great place to try and conduct a lesson. But whatever keeps people. I spent my first five years of school in a portable. Do they still do that? Yeah. Oh yes, they do. Oh yes, they do. I taught in a portable for many years. It's a joyous experience. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it would be a potential solution to this, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would, as long as they have correct ventilation um, and they are um, of an adequate size, right? You really have to monitor how many kids you put in a portable because uh, as a, with the voice of experience of long years being in one, um, there's really not a lot of ventilation. Now, some of the newer ones have great new ventilation units built into them. Um, but that would be what was necessary in order to, to make sure that you've got that correct airflow because th they don't have, you know, they don't have big windows. And even if they do have windows, oftentimes they don't open. Um, or you need, um, you, you'll need uh, screens on them. And the screens that school boards put on, and I understand why, are usually that solid metal screens. So they really don't allow for a whole lot of airflow. They don't let any bugs in. And they can't be easily ripped, <laughs> but they don't let much air in either, right? So, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a question that is really strictly not in your bailiwick, but I don't know how you could do your job without having some sense of this question. 
And it's a question really for all of us, but I'm putting it to you right now, which is when the virus, when the pandemic came along, we were told we had to take all these measures, lockdown, etc., in order to flatten the curve of the growth of the virus so that it wouldn't overwhelm our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. I'm repeating history as I understand it, maybe wrong. Somewhere along the line, we got it in our head that we were locking down until the virus went away, until the virus was no longer a threat, which is different from flattening the curve. And now that there are so few cases in Ontario um, on a daily basis, and well, the question is, what level of risk should we be prepared to accept when sending kids back to school? It's presumably something more than zero. It's always more than zero, right? I mean, whenever you have children together, and I mean, I, I remember years ago, there was a, a public health study done. I can't remember where, so I shouldn't really quote it, but, and they talked about the, the level of germs within any given environment. And schools were, especially elementary schools, were way up there, like, because they always have been. They're, they're these little germ factories, right? I mean, they just are. I, mean, I was an elementary teacher. Trust me, I know, right? <clears throat> any first year teacher will tell you they spend, they are sick the majority of that first year. And, and it doesn't matter what grade level you're teaching. Um, and just like parents know, right? As soon as your kid starts school, all of a sudden you, you get ill a lot more frequently in your home, right? Because your child's coming home with all of these bugs that they've picked up from everywhere else because it, it's just what happens when you put a group of kids together. I mean, you know, it, it's just reality of the, of the game. So whenever students go to school, there's always a bit of a risk, right? Like, I mean, I, I was teaching during SARS. I was teaching during H1N1. Um, we, you know, tried to be as careful as we could. We made sure kids were washing their hands. We, you know, certainly monitored, you know, if students were unwell, we would send them to the office. And sometimes parents would come and pick them up and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, so, you know, that there's always an element of risk. Um, but, you know, as, as a parent myself, I mean, my kids are through school now, but as a parent myself, I don't want there to be any risk for my child going to school every day. We work really hard to make our schools as safe as we possibly can. And I think that's where the, the sore off comes. When we're able to say, we have done everything humanly possible. We have done everything we can to make sure we're going to keep everybody as safe as we can. Understanding you can't protect against everything and you, you can't protect against, you know, could somebody end up getting sick? Absolutely. But do we all want to be able to look ourselves in the mirror and say, but we did our level best to make sure it wouldn't happen? Yes, we do want to be able to do that. I, I keep saying my, my goal is to get to the end of September without having to say, I told you so, right? Like that's my goal. I, I truly want that to be the case. Yeah, wouldn't we all? Yeah. Um, so where is the Ontario government's plan announced last week? Um, where is the Ontario government's plan deficient? Well, I, I think the Ontario government decided to look at, um, you know, they utilized the Sick Kids Report, right? And they talked all about how they needed, you know, What's the sick was kids great, report? they were going to use that. The Sick Kids released a report, actually they released two, but the, the most recent one was released literally the day before. And that had a whole raft of recommendations around school opening. One of the things they said in that report was as a priority, class size should be minimized as a priority. And this government did not do that. They, but they, they love to point to all the things they have done, but they did not do that. And I think that is, a, that is a key piece in all of this, right? If we want kids to be safe, 
then let's lower those class sizes so that, you know, we can truly do some distancing. Let's look at the different models that we have. Let's look at how are we going to do recesses? How are we going to do um, lunches? How are we going to make sure that we're keeping people safe? But most importantly, let's look at lowering the contact right? Because this isn't about, you know, maybe walking past somebody in the grocery store. This is about being locked in a room for hours with the same group of people. So maybe we need to meet, keep that group pretty low. And maybe we need to make sure that group is masked so that we truly put every single piece in place that we can to try and keep um, students safe. And, and quite frankly, you know, the funding they've provided is not adequate. And I know, you know, unions always say we need more money, but it's truly not adequate for, for what's required. Like boards aren't going to be able to do what they need to do with the monies they've been given. So it's 300 and some million that they've allocated to school opening, um, which is, uh, you know, as we'll talk later, that's a that's a bad day at the office for the Keelbergers, but uh, um, the uh, <laughs> staying out of allocated that. <laughs> <laughs> allocated three hundred and some million dollars. This the liberal plan. I'm a liberal, so I read the liberal plan and it got a little bit of press. Was a three billion dollar plan. That's a whack of cash, um, and that's yeah, obviously yeah. a significant different level than what the government was thinking about. But one of the things that struck me in the liberal plan was that a lot of the money was to go to hire 15,000 extra teachers. Are there 15,000 teachers sitting around waiting to get a job? I don't think there's 15,000. I, I think it would be very difficult to do. I mean, it, it truly would. Um, there, there are a number of teachers who are available, but, but no, you're correct. I don't, I don't think there's 15,000. But I think what that plan did was it said, look, you know, if, if we truly want to keep everybody safe, then this is this is the Cadillac, if you like, right? Like this is the model. Right. And then, you know, if you want to do it on the cheap, well, there are other models you could look at. It is what we've got, right? Where the government said, well, we right. can't possibly expend that kind of money. But would you not at least think about trying to make the effort? Would you not at least think about how can we leverage more funds? How can we? I mean, the, the federal government gave them $9 billion. Could, could they not have utilized some of that? You know, and I know that, you know, they'll, they'll be busy telling everybody. Well, they actually haven't spent any that. money on anything during the pandemic. All no, the money that's no, been spent has been at the federal level. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm aware of that. And that, that's the other piece, right? I mean, you've got a premium that stands up and says, we'll spare no expense. But then quite apparently they will. Because the key priority, according to sick kids, was lower class sizes, but they're not going to do that because, yeah, that is expensive. It absolutely is. And it would be very difficult to do. But should we not make best effort? And there are other things we can do in the meantime to mitigate, right? There are things that we can be doing if we can have sensible conversations, which which just doesn't happen with this government. I mean, they, they love to talk about how, how they consult with uh, stakeholders and with partners. But, you know, they have a very different definition of consultation than I do, right? To me, consultation is you have a two-way conversation and you take away from somebody and say, okay, well, I get that. Maybe we can work with it. Not, you know, here's our agenda. Here's what we think is going to happen. Tell us what you think. Thanks for that. And then they go and do whatever they want, right? Which is what we experience nearly all the time with this government. On occasion, so they we are treat you. They treat you like an interest group. They treat you like you're an interest group that represents teachers. So their view is that ah, we pretty much know what their point of view is going to be. Their point of view is going to be there should be more teachers and there should be more money for teachers and all that. It, they do not treat you as if you are a representative of the education system, as if you are somebody that would have something to contribute to education policy as opposed to what's in the interest of teachers. Are they wrong to see you that way? Yeah, th this government doesn't even respect the fact that we speak for teachers. 
right? Like they really don't because, and, and you hear it all the time because they'll make comments like, well, you know, the frontline teachers. Well, what the heck do you think I am? Right? Like that's where I come from. And not only that, that's where all my friends are right now. So you better believe I hear loud and clear from frontline teachers about what they need in the classrooms and about what their concerns are and about, like, I'm fully aware of all that. I'm in contact with teachers all the time. Just because I'm not physically stood in a classroom right now does not mean that I've suddenly disconnected that portion of my brain and I now no longer understand or appreciate what happens every day in those classrooms. They'd rather listen to people who, who haven't stood in front of a class in 40 years or who have no real concept of what happens within Ontario classrooms. Because, I mean, quite apparently they don't when they, you know, they seem to think that it's easy to just separate desks and have kids sitting in a row all facing in the same direction. Well, that's great when you have desks. But in many of our primary classrooms, they don't have desks. We have round tables. So how are we supposed to do that? Like, there's all of these different aspects that, that come as part of education, and they dismiss it when we raise it because we are seen purely and simply as the, the bargainers at a bargaining table as opposed to the advocates for, for our members, for our teachers, um, for our education workers, and also, quite frankly, for the students they serve every day. Because if I didn't advocate for the kids, my members would lynch me, right? Like, it is so important to them that the students they serve have a voice and they want to make sure that they're raising their voices for them and therefore I have better do it because that's what they expect from me. Like, they are, they are very well aware of how important it is that somebody speaks up. And I know there's so many parent groups now across the province who are starting to add their voices and raise their voices and say, you know, it's important that we all have a voice. But again, the government, they become special interest groups and we all get dismissed. And that's, that's where you run into this true frustration around, you know, just because I sit across a bargaining table and I bargain a contract does not mean to say that I can't talk about other things as well and that I don't represent my members on other aspects of education as well, because we do, you know, and clearly the government is clueless. I mean, they issued a new math curriculum in June and said, oh, we're going to implement in September during a pandemic. I don't know how more disconnected from reality you need to be than to do something like that. And it's not that we don't welcome a change to the curriculum. We actually do. But you know, how about we do it in a reasonable manner that allows us to actually do things properly? And it just, it, it, it baffles me. It, it truly does. Mm. Sorry, I told you I get frustrated. No. So. No. <laughs> Thank you. It was uh, thank you. It was very genuine, and I loved hearing it. Um, I've heard some people speculate that this situation this fall is going to result in kind of an educational caste system, where people who can afford childcare, or who can afford uh, to work from home, who can have the ability to work from home, will not send their kids to school, and that the people who actually have to go to a job and are expected to show up at their job and don't make enough money for childcare, will have to send their kids to school. Do you see that happening? I think, that's, I think that's a genuine concern. I think it's one that we share. And quite frankly, we've been, we've been concerned around the direction of this government since they first took office um, around, and I used to call it uh, privatization by stealth, right? So what you do is you take what has been a world-class publicly funded education system and you, you start to dismantle it right and you start to destable it and they did that right at the very start when they started talking about increase ironically they were going on about increasing class sizes um and and all of those pieces and you underfund the system and if you do that then you begin to erode confidence in the system and people start to and we and we lived it through the harris years 
right? That's, that's pretty much what the playbook was then. Uh, far more aggressive this time. Um, so I don't know, maybe they learned a lesson last time, but far more aggressive this time off the bat. We managed to, to stem that tide. Um, and certainly when they talked about the, the e-learning, that was another piece for us that um, was a red flag because we know um, not just within Canada, but globally, uh, there's been a real um, push by some interests um, to allow different corporations in and get their foot in the door and start to become uh, more aggressive players in education. And it, and it is privatization, right? So then we have managed to, to stem that tide um, and we were hopeful. Um, and then the pandemic hit, right? And many parents were uh, have been forced to work from home. They've been, you know, working with their with their students at home um, with differing levels of ability. So we have students who may have parents who can work with them and facilitate that and have access to all the resources they need. And we have many students who don't. You know, they, they don't have stable internet. They don't, if they have internet at home, um, they don't have uh, access to the devices they need. Um, they don't have somebody who can actually sit and assist them in the place of the teacher, right? Because I'm not going to be there to sit next to them and explain something. I can do it online, but it's really not the same. Um, so, you know, you do end up... Not to up mention the discipline to actually do it. You know, it's hard yes. when you're an adult to work a full day when you're at home. There's so many distractions yeah. to it. You imagine a bloody kid. It's ridiculous. No, no, it is. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've all, we've all, we're all living it, right? Like, I mean, most of us are doing things like, you know, I'll do this and then I've got a load of laundry I need to change over and then I need to move on to my next meal. Like, that's what we're doing, right? I mean, everybody's right. doing it. You know, we're, we're distracting ourselves. Um, you know, I, my kitchen floor was never quite so clean as when, uh, you know, the government makes different announcements because it enables me to vent my fury <laughs> there before I have to then, you know, get on and right. do interviews or whatever else I need to do. But you're, you're absolutely right, right? There's all of those. And if you don't have somebody who can redirect and say, no, you know what, you really do need to get this done, then, you know, as a child, how do I do that? right if nobody's going to tell me to and I, and I always say you know my classroom management used to be pretty good but I can't do it virtually right like the kids know I can't see what they're doing right <laughs> like it's different than when they're actually in the classroom with me and I know if you're paying attention or not so I, I think that is a real concern as well and, and you're absolutely right you know a lot of parents and I can understand why are looking at this plan and looking at their children and saying, I don't think I want to put my kid in that classroom. And to me, if we make it safe, if we're able to say, no, you know what? Like, they'll be fine. We've got the right distancing. We've got smaller class sizes. We're going to have all of these measures in place. We will have more children returning to school, which is ultimately where they need to be. But I think, you know, we are going to have parents who select not to. And they may choose not to come back to the publicly funded system at all. Right. Right. Yeah, I know the remote learning thing. Mr. Lundin used to throw chalk at me to get my attention. You cannot do that remotely. You can't even do that if you're in the same room. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing that now. <laughs> There's none of that happening. <laughs> that's over? All right. So no, that's I, completely we, over. We're going to have to wrap this up, but I want to ask you a practical question. There's a month left. What practically can be done? Understanding that months have been pooched away without anything being done, what can be done in the last month? What can we accomplish here? Well, you know, in a perfect world, I think we could um, actually sit and hammer out a way of getting kids back into school um, maybe not all right on the first day, but getting kids back in in a safe manner. Um, if we're able to, to work together on, on, a, on a real plan, I think we need to look at other modifications we can do, other staggered start times we could look at. Um, you know, there's, there's many different models that we could, we could sort of play around with. 
And if we had the freedom to have those conversations or if they were worthwhile, right? I mean, that's, that's the other piece, right? When you have a conversation and you give a suggestion and you get told, oh, you know, we'll take that away and then you hear nothing. Right. And, right. and so an announcement comes out that obviously did not even consider what you had suggested. You know, just, just tell me, just look me in the eye and say, Liz, that's not happening. Right. Yeah. And then we can say, okay, well, how about, and then you start throwing other ideas out, but to, to patronize by saying, Oh, leave that with us. It is just, I mean, it's offensive, right? Like, don't do that. Just tell us straight that there is a price tag on this, that, you know, what the premier said is not true, that, you know, apparently the expense will be spared. And then we can all just deal with the fallout when it comes. And I, I mean, I, I'm not, um, I'm not a defeatist by nature. Like I usually like to be an optimist um, and, and try and see uh, the light at the end of that tunnel. Um, so I will continue to, to pray really hard that we can, we can try and find a way through that keeps everybody safe come September, understanding that the minutes are ticking. Like they really are. Liz, thank you so much for doing this. Learned a lot. No it's great to get to know you. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's nice to chat. Thank you. <laughs> it was good to vent all that frustration. That was good. It sets me up for the rest <laughs> of the day. <laughs> That's what this show is good for, venting. And if you want to hear venting, you should stick yep. around and listen to Jenny Byrne in our second half. <laughs> I have to go to another meeting or I would. <laughs> she has an opinion about the wee controversy that may come up. <laughs> oh, really? Isn't that stunning? <laughs> I can say I'm staying out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, it's all for the children. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. I told you I'm staying away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Liz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. If we've learned anything over the past few weeks, it's that in times of crisis, governments matter. So if you've never heard of Queen's Park today, it's one of Ontario's most trusted news sources for political insiders and for people who actually need to know what is happening at the legislature every day. Whether it affects your business, your stakeholders, or the health and safety of your family, Queen's Park Today is tracking the ongoing developments in Ontario. The newsletter lands in your inbox first thing every morning, so you can start your day off already ahead of the game. During a crisis, the importance of governments increases dramatically. The only way to get really get the detailed boots-on-the-ground coverage you need is by subscribing to Queen's Park today. There's also BC Today and Alberta Today, which are great for people who want to know what's going on out west, but don't have the time to follow it closely. To get a free two-week trial of Queen's Park Today, BC Today, or Alberta Today, go to politicstoday.news and hit the free trial button. That's politicstoday.news backslash free trial. All right, Jenny Byrne, Chris Ball, how are we today? Things are... Chris, how I'm are you? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you, David? I'm, I'm well. I'm in a driving rainstorm, so my oh. internet is probably unstable. We'll see what we can do. How are you feeling about uh, your beloved Habs? I'm feeling like they're not good, Jenny. I'm feeling uh. like they're not a good team. Well, they're not a great um, team. They're they not a great just team. Evidently, I don't know. I don't know why I had different expectations because they're the same team that they were in February. Obviously, they just don't now, have listen, any talent. Uh, Nick Suzuki, lots of talent. Kerry Price. Uh, the score would have been much different last night if he hadn't uh, played the way that he did. So I think, uh, and 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 also you saw, uh, even though they've got Max Domi on the fourth line. Uh, he became uh, he became a shadow to uh, to Sidney Crosby for the last part of that game. It was really getting under his skin. So I, I think that although they lost last night, I thought they played uh, I thought they played decent. Uh, I didn't feel terrible um, after uh, uh, after the loss. I, I I don't feel like I I am assuming that Leafs fans did uh, uh, after the loss on uh, on Sunday. So. <laughs> 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 and so uh yeah so listen i think the story of the playoffs is going to end up being edmonton i i, I think uh they they didn't have a great first game but like Connor mcdavid is a is a machine his uh his hat trick last night like he is he is showing why he is the best uh hockey player in the world right now 
You obviously so. were not paying close attention to Joel Armia last night. If you think Connor McDavid <laughs> is the best hockey player. In the world. <laughs> well, I, I, I did see that uh, uh, Jonathan Taves and uh, Patrick Kane had a very sad little press conference after, uh, uh, after the, uh, the game with Edmonton. So uh, anyways, it's good. I'm, I am just happy that hockey is back. I am watching every game I can. Um, uh, I will have to go in between like we testimony and, and hockey, like when they, uh, when, when they're, they're colliding. Uh, um, but, uh, it's, uh, hockey being back makes me very happy. I'm not subjected to having to like watch soccer, for example. Speaking of which, I feel sorry for Kendra. I feel sorry for Kendra. Sorry. We're subjected to watching soccer. Who would do that? It's raining outside. You could always watch that. happen. <laughs> I just want to say, I just want to say about the Habs. That, you know, poor Carey Price, he's played like a demon these last two games. But my God, what a lonely job. Like when, you know, when Ken Dryden had his famous outing in 1971, if he made an enormous save, he knew there was a chance that Frank Mahovlich or Yvonne Cornway or Jean Beliveau were going to get a goal. Um, and if Carey Price makes a save, makes a huge save, and the puck goes down the ice, and it's in the hands of Dale Weiss and uh, Jordan Wheel or people like that, there's no fucking chance they're going to score. It, it takes a deflection. It takes a. That's why they're always laying in front of the net, hoping that the puck will go off them. They have no offensive talent. It's just gruesome to watch. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just. I'm going to enjoy the playoffs. I think it would be worse to be a Leafs fan. Well, it better be because if the Canadians are going to suck, the Leafs better lose. <laughs> well, right? because I'm not accepting. I still think John Tortorella is going to probably have something to say about that, and probably just come out and street fight every single Leaf uh, if it gets down to it to win this series. So listen to the whing- listen to the whinging, Jenny. Listen to the whinging. No accountability. Leaf fans have no accountability. The, 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 the Leafs, unlike the Canadians, the Leafs have talent. The talent just doesn't show up. Yeah, they, they're they're arrogant. Like Austin Matthews shit talking uh, uh, prior to the game, and then and then uh, did he get a, did he Chris? Sorry, I, I I forgot. Did he get any points uh, during the first game? No, he didn't. Okay, I just I needed. I wasn't sure. I wanted to make. Sure, I wanted to. Uh, I just wanted you to confirm whether I. Hey man, I, I I'm not saying. Them. Hey, look, I'm not letting them off the hook. I'm just saying. Nylander must have COVID or something, I, right? Nylander. They all have COVID, Dave. That's what it is. The bubble is burst. It is like the MLB, and that is the reason why the Leafs uh, had such a shit game the other day. So I'm not letting them off the hook. I'm just saying that if it like the secret weapon will be John Tortorella putting somebody in a fucking headlock uh, to win this series. Uh, you saw sure. him get, get in the street fight in the middle of, uh, against Calgary a year ago. So I wouldn't put it past him yeah. this time. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyways, and after the exhibition game Tuesday night, you guys were planning the, uh, the route for the, uh, uh, socially distanced. It's uh, always COVID, there. We have it always covering. in the back pocket. Don't worry. We've like, <laughs> well, we've learned from the Raptors. We've had it. It's like, you you dust it off and it's all good. Don't worry. We got this. Lord almighty. What is the first stage three thing you did when you were allowed to stage three? What did you do? I, 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 I allowed myself to stay in stage two. <laughs> I was like, man, stage two still <laughs> feels pretty freaking comfy. Frankly. Uh, I don't, I, 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 right. I don't think I'm going to be, you know, sat at the bar six feet away from other folks for quite a while. Uh, it's just, you know, it, I still feel a little bit nervous about the whole thing. And maybe that's just me. Uh, no wedge salads for me. <laughs> Jenny, have you done something daring in stage three? Uh, I actually don't think I've done anything. If I'm thinking stage three related, although I would go to like, I would go and sit in a restaurant. I have no problem with that, but it's summer and we have so few months and, and 2020 has been even worse than, or 20, uh, uh has been, uh, a shitty year. So, uh, I haven't sat in a restaurant, although I'd have no problem with it, but I'm still enjoying patios and I've had pedicures and manicures and all of, uh, uh, and all of those, uh, all of those things. I'm glad the, the world is seemingly opening up, but I, I have to say, like I was, uh, we had a family golf tournament, uh, this weekend and golf's a terrible fucking game. Um, but, uh, normally we have a law ball tournament, but because of the COVID, uh, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't do that. So my family golfed and, uh, there was a lot of beer. Uh, did you know golf courses can sell beer at 9.00 AM? Um, I, who knew? Um, so, uh, I, 
but it, how else would you play golf at 9 a.m well it was it was best ball and i i was on the team with two of my cousins um uh, who both golf and I do not. So I didn't even have to drive. Like, unless they fuck things up, I was just like, you guys are good. I I'll only start, I'll only start, I'll use the nine iron and the putter and I need nothing else for this tournament. You know, so anyways, most people, if they only played with a nine iron, most people, if they only played with a nine iron and a putter would have a better score than they get with their full bag of clubs. Yeah, I don't even, like, I don't know, like, my cousin would pull out, like, oh, I'm going to use the five iron for that. And I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. Uh, all I heard was beer at 9 a.m. I'd just be on the course and like, play through, it's fine. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <clears throat> now, listen, I know you both listen to Liz Stewart, and I just want to talk about this for a minute, because it's going to be a big political issue in Ontario. And, Chris, I'm going to start with you, because... Jenny's going to need time to wind up her ammo on this thing because if she's going to come to the if she's going to come to the defense of it, because surely this is an issue that the government has uh, fucked the dog on completely. I mean, this is a plan that could have been released in May. It's a uh, so lacking in detail or thinking, and it has no money attached to it to do anything. So all of the people who've been writing voluminous thought pieces about how we would do this and how we would arrange physical spacing kids. None of that got considered. They basically said, put a mask on and go back to school. Um, yep. This is going to come back to bite them in the ass in a big way. Is it not? A hundred percent. I think this is going to be, you know, uh, generally up to this point, I think this government in Ontario has gotten some points, some pretty big points for their handling of the situation to, to this point. And, you know, now we're kind of reaching that really not great Venn diagram of like kids, parents, health and safety, teachers unions. You manage to piss everybody off simultaneously and all of which are going to have long memories and all of which will not will not be very happy if little Johnny comes home and starts infecting the rest of the family. I think this is going to be something that folks are going to remember as one of the biggest fuck ups from this provincial government. And especially when you have, you know, the premier out, I think it was like April 30th, you know, beating his chest and saying, Oh, you know, we're not going to put kids back in crowded classrooms. I'm not going to put a single child at risk. And then you flash forward a few months and here we are, you know, there you go, kitties wear a mask or don't. Um, like, we're fine with all of this, right? So, and we're also finding, like, I'm finding what's really annoying is that they're they're using this whole sick kids report uh, as sort of convenient cover. So sometimes they're, they think it's, it's great and they take the recommendations, whereas other recommendations, like on page two, where it says we need to address structural deficiencies, such as large class sizes, small classrooms, and poor ventilation, they're just like, ah, fuck that, who cares? So I think this is going to be a hot political issue for the next little while. And, you know, if, if we start seeing caseloads rise and if we start seeing Ontario schools being the Petri dish that's starting some of that, I don't know how, you know, how they can defend themselves against that. Jenny, what have they been doing? Seriously. Well, listen, uh, David, to be fair, I have, I have been very uh, vocal in terms of how I think governments, including the Ontario government, have handled COVID over the last four or five months. So, um, I, you know, we've talked about, we've talked about schools. Uh, we've talked about schools before. I think that uh, we have no idea whether uh, schools will be, quote, as Chris says, petri dishes. Uh, and any of the, uh, and I say this, I, I don't have kids, but every parent that I have essentially spoken to, that friends of mine, uh, uh, they are less concerned about that and they are more concerned with their kids getting back to school. Not only, I think, for their own mental health and the fact that they have to figure out how they're going to uh, continue to work, whether they have to work at home or whether they, they are now going into the office. Um, but it's also been a, uh, like everything COVID related, it has been a huge toll on kids' mental health, um, uh, being at home and not being around their, uh, not being around their friends. And so, uh, they've gone months without being able to play with friends. They've, you know, not been able to see their grandparents. They've not been able to see their cousins. They've, they've not been able to do what they normally have done. And, uh, I think all governments, including the Ontario government, I think Ontario was a bit slow uh, in terms of uh, uh, coming out and announcing what they plan to do. But kids have to go back to school. And, um, you know, uh, David, you touched on it in terms of uh, what uh, we, the view of history was uh, or whether it was your view or whether it was 
the actual view. No, you're right. Like when we locked down in March, uh, it was not to stop the spread of COVID. It was to ensure that when we all got it, there would be a hospital bed for us when we, when we got it. And so uh, there is a possibility they'll, there will be no vaccine. But to kids, to kids, and I know the, the argument is in terms of spreading it to parents and grandparents, to kids, there is a bigger chance of fatality or getting very sick if they get the regular flu as opposed to COVID. And so this goes back to my problem with governments of all stripes, that uh, uh, they need to be coming up with ways or recommendations for us to continue to live our life if there is no vaccine, because there is a chance that there might not be a vaccine. That is, uh, that, that, is the, that, is the, that is the challenge for sure. And I, I agree with you, that Jenny, that parents want their kids to go back, uh, back to school. But if this is a false start, like let's say it's the Major League Baseball season, or let's say it's, it's Doug, the, Doug Ford got this plan for Rob Manfred. Man. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I mean, if it goes bad, let's assume none of us are education experts, so we're not going to debate the details of the policy. But on the political side, if this goes bad, it's a big political problem, right? Like education is one of those things that defeats provincial governments. Yeah, and 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 it'll go back. Like I, I don't know why we're assuming it's going to be Major League Baseball. Uh, like I, I, I like that. That not assuming. Not assuming. That, I'm saying if it was, I don't assume it is. Well, but no, but it it's is. almost this. This is this is the problem I have with all of this stuff. Okay, so let's say the provincial government was late in uh, in in giving their uh, the plan in terms of opening schools. So we're a month away. Um, it's almost like people are sitting. It's like the, the kids at Tornady Bellwoods that were like drinking in May. It was almost this zeal that people had to be like, well, if it goes, it goes bad, it's going to be like Major League Baseball. And if it goes bad, everyone's going to be upset and everyone's going to be infected with the COVID. Like at the end of the day, governments just like us are like, and, and I have been the most, I have been more critical than the two of you guys on this podcast or anyone else in terms of how governments have handled this. Like I, I have been realistically critical, but at this point, uh, I'm not sure why we're we're sitting and saying what they're doing is any different than other provinces across the uh, the country. Kids have to go back to school, and there is a uh, very, 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 very small chance that uh, they will uh, uh, have any health related impacts regarding uh, regarding COVID. I don't think this is a thing. I I, I don't think there's anyone arguing that uh, arguing that there shouldn't be social distancing and there shouldn't be these bubbles with with that kids will be part of and what have you but kids have to go back to school yeah nobody's arguing the kids don't have to go back to school it's how they go back to school right and like the government could have taken another month like to say okay let's fix some of these ventilation issues let's talk about some of these class size issues let's be a bit more creative rather than just saying hey wear a mask or if you're younger don't wear a mask and if you're a high school student then you kind of you go on and off like there there the the challenge is in the fact like i mean i get it People need these kids to go back to school. It's just how it's happening is 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 incredibly risky. But 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 Chris, the the premier will say, and and uh, you've you've had healthcare professionals. He is basically making every decision he does based on the advice of Dr. David Williams. So if if you are against what he's doing, he's doing exactly what what David Williams and the public. No, Health that's that's his, his whole saying. argument has been. Oh, I've got this like round table that I'm listening to that he no. won't actually even disclose who he's no, talking but, to. But Chris, that's been my problem. My problem is 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 that I don't believe politicians should hide behind healthcare uh, professionals, uh, essentially bureaucrats, uh, uh, for decisions. But that is what the Ontario government is. So all of the recommendations and the back to school plan is based on the recommendations of uh, David Doctor uh, uh, David Williams. So there you go, a healthcare professional. I haven't heard of that guy in months. No. Um, the uh, it's interesting you bring him up. Um, the if I had been an advisor to the government, I would have been on the side of we obviously can't guarantee outcomes, but if things go badly at school. I want to be able to say that we did everything. I want to be able to say that we went the extra mile. I don't want anybody to be able to look at us and say we cheaped out or we skimped out or we didn't do enough thinking about that because 
people won't blame us for not being able to stop COVID, but they will blame us for being sloppy or inadequate in our thinking. And I'm really curious as to why, at a time when nobody seems to care about this very much, the Ford government's throwing around uh, dimes like they're manhole covers. Like, uh, why wouldn't they put maybe $3 billions a lot, I don't know, but something into these issues that the teachers and, and Chris are talking about, ventilation, more spacing, these kinds of things. I really don't understand. And sorry, Jenny, I'm not putting you in the spot. You're not accountable for these people. This isn't you to defend. I'm just spouting that I don't understand why I believe they've put themselves in real political jeopardy here. Because it is going to be seen as a minimal plan. And if the minimal plan doesn't hold, then you have to justify why you had a minimal plan. But why is it seen as a minimal plan? Like they are doing social um, distancing. There's, well, but they haven't provided their... new space for social distancing to actually happen. So well, they're, they're, but, they're they're gonna no, but, but they're going to have to. That's part, of the, not, that's part of the plan. And they're not staffing up in the way they need to. Like basically, what is $1,600 for school or something crazy? So like you get one new staff member to help clean, to help do all these other things that need to happen. Like, like so... Like you, they've gotten like there was the Cadillac plan that was referred to before, and now we're getting the Yugo. Like you can't give me like a Volkswagen, you can't give me a Honda Civic, you can't give me something that's in between. Like even just as a starting point, because I mean, I, again, like I I agree with David here that if you know if our schools become petri dishes, it's going to be a political like a, a nuclear bomb hitting this government. Like because you're you're pissing off parents, you're pissing off kids, and you're pissing off teachers. And that is not a good a, a good outcome for uh, any government. Speaking of nuclear bombs, speaking of nuclear bombs, prime ministers at a parliamentary committee last week telling Yay! the story of birds of events being held accountable at a parliamentary committee last week. This does not happen. This is unprecedented. I want to tell um, I want to tell listeners, viewers will be able to tell that I am wearing my. Super Tramp Crime of the Century t-shirt today because that is how some people on this panel might characterize the we story. But I will say that it's also the only Super Tramp t-shirt I had. And if I had a t-shirt of their second and even better album, Crisis What Crisis, I might have been inclined to wear that uh, as my opinion about the, uh, the we scandal. Jenny, without any further ado... How has the last <laughs> week since we last spoke, how has that moved along the we issue? Well, I think that the Prime Minister's testimony, Katie Telford's testimony, did no favors. We, When we taped our last podcast, uh, no favors for the Liberal government. When we taped the, taped the last podcast, we were in the middle of the uh, Kielberger testimony, which, which ended up just becoming extremely bizarre and weird. Uh, not only were they condescending and arrogant, uh, they just, it was like they were sitting and holding hands and weirdly looking at each other, which in a Game of Thrones <laughs> episode type way, like they have, they have a very weird dynamic for, uh, I, I've had less chemistry with some guys I've dated than the two of those guys have. And, <laughs> Tell me about the rabbits, <laughs> friend. <laughs> and so I, I, you know, so you had that and then Thursday the prime minister ended up staying for, uh, for 90 minutes. And, and, uh, uh, he was another one that did no favors. I think that he, uh, and I know Chris has opinions on this. I think that uh, the, the uh, uh, no, no opinions at nah, all. Chris. No opinions we'll get to me. Um, I, I, what I thought was weird was I think that they thought the, uh, their ace in the, their ace in the hole or the rabbit in the hole, or they were going to come out and, and Trudeau said, well, on, on May 8th, when this was table dropped at cabinet, um, I was stunned that we was selected and I made the bureaucrats go back. There are so many wrong things about that. As someone who has been in government, as someone who has seen billion dollar projects or million dollar projects go through cabinet, there is a 0% chance that the prime minister just found out about it at, uh, at cabinet uh, at, at all. He chairs cabinet. He's the prime minister. And uh, don't you make the cabinet agenda if you're the prime minister? One would think. Yes. Very good point. Right. 
So you don't show up and find out what's on the agenda of the meeting you're sharing, do you? Exactly. Well, unless they really do things differently in in the Trudeau government, which I guess they possibly could, but it doesn't take away uh, it doesn't take away from from the facts. So he said he was so upset about this that he pushed it back for the bureaucrats to uh, to do more due diligence. And so uh, and they came back and said, well. As we said, the Kielbergers are the only people to uh, uh, to be able to administer this program. And some of the other things, uh, David, and we've been on TV uh, uh, talking about this, but in a nutshell, and I know I'll have a, a second or third chance to talk about this. So, so basically, we've got more dates in terms of the timeline that actually raise more questions than, uh, than answers. And the fact that the uh, $32 million that was given to the Kielbergers up front and they were going to administer this program was actually through a thir- a corporate entity. So it wasn't the, the me to, it wasn't the we charity. It wasn't the me to we corporation, which is seemingly a real estate uh, company that just keeps buying up the East end of uh, end of the downtown here in Toronto. Dell corporation. Uh, it, it, one might call it that. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, it, it's a separate company. So it was going to the corporate arm. And what was interesting is in the contract, the me to we, uh, uh, the corporate real estate shell company, uh, Chris, Thank you. um, and, uh, basically could use unlimited expenses of the government program without any, uh, justification. So no paperwork, no, uh, going back to the government of Canada, meaning that the Kielbergers could, pay their salaries, could do all their expenses, could buy another fucking building for, uh, for like, there was no rules there. So it, there's more, as this goes, and as the liberals think they're doing issues management on this, it's getting mu- murkier and murkier and worse and worse in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, action for it coming out to actually what happened here. Do you think that the government, do you think the bureaucracy actually said to the government, that this program uh, can only be run by uh, the Kielbergers or by the we, or do you think the government, the bureaucracy said to the government, this is a dumb program, this is a dumb idea, nobody can make this work, but if you want to do it, get the Kielbergers to do it, because we can and we won't do it. And no. even the Kielbergers appear in their testimony not to have believed it would work because they seem to have thought that you know, they'd only end up spending two or three hundred thousand of the five hundred thousand that had come through. Uh, listen, yeah. Chris, I, I, so I'm I'll just trying to understand what what really did the bureaucracy communicate to the government about this program? Well, how the fuck would we know? They, they've released nothing. Ian yeah. Shugart tried to say. Ian Shugart kind of danced around it. Um, but if the if the government, if the bureaucrats, if Ian Shugart and the DMs at ESDC and other minister, ministries finance felt that this was the only way to implement this program. You know how we would know that? It's because the government would have already re- released it because the, the bureaucrats paper everything. They literally put everything in writing, 100%. There is, on a program like this, there is no verbal advice. They would put it in writing. And so if the government had that, that, that advice, they all were ready would have uh, implemented. This was a bizarre program on so many so many levels, and I'm going to let Chris jump in because the the NDP Julian and Angus started going down the actual program, uh, the, the idiocy of this program uh, at the committee hearings uh, last week. Yeah, so like, sorry, Chris, yeah, I just feel like so April 22nd, the Prime Minister set this dumpster on fire and then pushed it down the hill, and then on May 8th had the opportunity to say, "Wait, we should probably just kill this thing. Let's stop it," but he didn't. I think where I'm really interested is a couple points. Like one is this pushback. So, you know, Trudeau said, whoa, 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 guys, this is, no, uh, this is going to cause some problems. He's aware of the perception of a conflict of interest. He knew deep down inside that this was a bad. And then he kind of used the public service as a bit of a human shield to try to then re-justify his decision, right? And so I, I'm also really curious about what does that pushback look like? Is he saying, no, guys, there's going to be a problem here. Uh, find me somebody exactly like we who can maybe make this thing happen exactly the way that we want it to do. And of course, the answer to that's going to be like nobody else, right? So is he using the public service as a means to justify this whole best and only logic, which again, as I said in the last pod, is just like there's just so much, so many holes in this friggin' thing is in that whole logic of best and only. But then also like one of the little things that I picked up on is, is if I'm Bill Morneau, 
right now, I'm not feeling very happy and I'm not feeling the warming glow of the PMO on me right now, right? So if you're Bill you Morneau, know, you did you don't look like you look right now because you didn't get the fine baby sleep that you got last night. <laughs> no, exactly, right? Like, you know, he, <laughs> you know, the 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 defense and it's really interesting to watch the coverage of like how how folks have called this. Like, oh, he came to the defense of the finance minister. If you read Le Devoir the other day, it's like, no, actually they didn't. Uh, it was it wasn't the sort of you know doubling down on a minister that you apparently think is you know above board nothing wrong happened here it was very hedgy and very like you know well yeah I think he did something wrong but I look at the other people in the world that are doing good and Bill's one of those and let's look back at the good things Bill did like yeah maybe he was wrong but I don't know so you know what does that mean for down the line are they kind of setting up a little bit of a situation where if things get worse they can jettison old bill into the sun and maybe we figure out you know who our new finance minister is but again like i i i find it very hard to believe well the, PM well, the pmo's new version of events the pmo's new version of events did not provide Morno with any cover. No. It only provided the prime minister with cover. Exactly, right? Right. right? And they're unconcerned about Bill being out there with his ass hanging in the wind. They're, un 100%. they're leaving him out there. And how can you say that, like, the P like again, like to Jenny's point, like the PM doesn't walk into a cabinet meeting and go, all right, guys, what are we talking about this week? What's yeah. going on? Like, it's not, it, it doesn't work that way. And, like, and you know that what. I, I even find the concept of pushing back to be a weird one for a prime minister. It, it, it sounds like you're such a passive participant in you, your government yes. that something would come to you and but you this would. Is Push this back is, against it. Agreed. And this is the change, and it'll be interesting to see if this has ramifications for them. So this has been the change in their messaging on the public service. So before it was, well, the public service recommended this, and, and it was a binary choice, and we had no choice, and we wanted to go ahead with this. The messaging changed. They bas It's now basically changed going, the public service gave us no choice. We had to do it. And so we'll see if you know, a Bob Fife isn't brown enveloped something from uh, from senior members of the public service that are finally like, you want to know something, go fuck yourself. Because this program, if you actually speak to the program, which everyone like, you know, David, you've, we've said on the podcast, it's all about the children. This is a program. So this is for students who didn't qualify for the CERB. So if you're a, if you're a student who, is, yeah. who worked in 2019 to put themselves through school, uh, they probably, like, if you made $5,000 or more, you've got the CERB. This is for a volunteer program to get paid, which again is, I'm, I'm starting with just idiocy right paid there. Less than minimum wage. Anyway, sorry. It, less than minimum wage. And so um, you had to work, you had to, for this program, you have to volunteer a hundred hours to get a thousand bucks and you have to volunteer then another hundred hours to get 2000 bucks. So we're talking about two and a half weeks work. And then you have to do another two and a half weeks work of 40 hours a week to get another thousand dollars. If you worked 199 hours, you're shit out of luck. You still only get the thousand dollars. So if you're a student, if they truly cared about students, they would have topped up the Canada summer jobs program, which delivers 70,000 jobs per year across the country. And students are at least like here in Ontario, I think the student minimum wage is $13 and 70 cents or what have you. They would have topped that up by another 20,000, so to speak. And we know that the program can be delivered by someone other than the Kielbergers because every year the Canadian government delivers the program as it is. If, if they truly, truly care this, there was only what has become more and more clear over the last week is there is only two people that benefited from, uh, the Canada student grant program. And those were, that was Mark and Craig Kielberger. There was no other reason. And if you want to just even look at like the early, like take away the $43 million they were set to make. They laid off what 700 people in March. Um, and they were hiring four to 500 people of those people back from, uh, uh, to basically work on this program. So you know what that means? They go from laid off to temporary laid off. And you know what we doesn't have to do? They don't have to pay those people severance. And so th that would have been in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for 400 people. And so this is just from start to finish. This was 100% about saving this boondock, dock, dock, like doggle uh, uh, embarrassment that is this, uh, this charity, so-called charity. See, I don't believe that. I don't. I. I do not. I do not believe that. I'm pretty. I'm. I'm pretty tough on the government over this issue. Generally, I think certainly liberals think I am, but, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that Trudeau invented this program to help we. 
I think Trudeau invented David, this program right. because he fucking loves Nobody's volunteerism saying. and he loves these ideas about getting kids, Katimovic, and getting kids involved in shit. He genuinely loves that stuff. He, I believe he actually wanted a program like this. The fact that it was going to help the Kielbergers would have been a happy coincidence, not the purpose, in my view. David, David, uh, there is only one thing I agree with you that, what, that you just said, and that is uh, Justin Trudeau did not design this program. Uh, we actually designed it. Yes. That is the only thing I agree. The rest of it. What are you saying, Chris? The rest is gobbledygook. Yeah, I mean, does Justin Trudeau love volunteerism? Sure. Um, does that mean that he has to pay people, you know, below minimum wage to actually do it? No. Students didn't want this either. There's been student groups on the record saying we wanted to serve. We didn't want this. Like, if you really wanted to help us, there are way better ways to help us. And sure, you know, volunteerism is great and he loves it and all this stuff. But I agree, it wasn't Justin Trudeau that, that put this together. It was we. Like, they were shopping this around and it got kind of massaged. And then they talked to somebody in the PMO on the 5th. And then apparently Justin didn't know about it. And then all of a sudden on the 8th, oh my God, what happened? Like, so no, I don't think Justin did this. It was, it was we. They were shopping this around and trying to get, trying to get this, trying to get this thing moving. And the federal government enabled them, and then and and gave them yes, and, and gave them hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, they designed. They they basically said, "We're with you. We're going to de design a close to one billion dollar program. We're going to give you thirty two million up front and uh, off the race." And just on the public service piece, like I brought up earlier, like the the president of the Public Service Lines of Canada has already issued a statement saying, "Like, no, actually, guys, we could have done this," and they've pushed back on uh on the on trudeau's line on this as well and like i wouldn't be surprised if we see a bit more of that i mean it, they've the they've they're playing a dangerous game here also with regards to like using again the public service as a bit of a human shield it's like no no it was them and no no they were the only ones that could do it and they told me this and it has nothing to do with me and i pushed back on them like he couldn't have made a call to the ethics commi commissioner like he made a call to the ethics commissioner about a podcast but he doesn't make a call to, to the ethics commissioner about a possible billion dollar program. Are you fucking kidding me? Like it's ridiculous. Okay. So where we're at now in my judgment is that there is enough smoke around we, the organization and around this decision-making process that there's a heavy political stench on the government. But there's not a proven allegation that would cause a resignation yet. The core government line that this was something that was brought to them by the public service and recommended by the public service, that has not been factually punctured, as suspicious as you are about it. It's not been factually punctured. So where does this issue go now? What's the next move? Well, it's 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 because they have not, uh, to your point, because they have uh, not shown the proof that the public service recommended this because they didn't. Uh, this issue isn't going away for the liberals. Every week we find more and more information and there is no way that the uh, the conservatives and the NDP are going to let this uh, issue go. And the problem Trudeau has is I think they're they're, you know, to what we talked about, I think they're trying to set it up for Morneau to take the fall on this. But what he has done, what is, what is the difference? And we've said, so what would be the reason that Morneau takes the fall on this program? The buck doesn't stop with Morneau. It stops with Trudeau. Uh, Morneau, took, uh, uh, Morneau took a vacation that he forgot to pay back, forgot uh, to pay back in the tens of thousands. Uh, Justin Trudeau did the exact same thing with the Aga Khan. Uh, Bill Murnau's family has financially benefited uh, because his daughter works for we as one other daughter was uh, was involved. Uh, but Justin Trudeau's family, uh, between expenses and uh, salary and uh, speaking engagements, made close to a half a million dollars. So what what can the liberal government actually say is the reason that Bill Murnau was fired that Justin Trudeau has not done himself? Well, I think that what's interesting um, sorry, Chris, I don't mean to jump in, but I, I, I think that what's interesting about the government's new timeline from last week is it certainly does raise very legitimate questions about what happened between May 8th and the cabinet approval meeting. Uh, if he pushed back asking for more due diligence what, on what due diligence was done on we, what other uh, forms of delivering the program were, um, uh, were contemplated, 
and uh, my internet connection is unstable, and Jenny and Chris are frozen. This oh, no. does not frozen look David. good to me, and I'm gone. Has, has... Well, you're you're frozen, you're, to us, Chris. You're frozen, you're to frozen. Us. Oh, we've lost I think David. We've lost a chair. I think. Uh, so I think, um, I think it's the vice, is the vice chair takes over. And that would be me. So I give the floor to the member of parliament for Carlton. Okay, and then the member from Davenport gets, uh, gets <laughs> another round. <laughs> I yield to you, the, the member from Carlton. Any last uh, thoughts, Jenny? <laughs> well, listen, I, I, listen, I'm going to repeat, uh, Chris, what I, what I said earlier. I think this is going to be, uh, this is going to be interesting. I don't think we've seen the last of talking about we, I think the government has, uh, managed this issue uh, absolutely horrible and continues. And I think that as the documents start getting put together for the ethics commissioner, I think we're going to see more and more. Uh, uh, it's going to become more and more enlightened uh, in terms of uh, how this program came to uh, fruition. Yeah. And I need to see cabinet confidence waived. I need the opposition just to keep on hammering that. Let's open the doors. Let's the best disinfectant is light. Sometimes, exactly. sometimes not at all, but light. Right. Let's exactly. shine some light on this thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, and again, like I, if I'm if I'm Billy Morneau, I'm a little worried right now. And especially after Mark Carney just uh, packed up his five million pound condo in London and is back in town. So watch your back there, Bill, I would say. Well, I, I, I'm not sure, though, if I'm if I'm Justin Trudeau, I'm not sure I'm going to bring a uh, Paul Martin uh, uh, liberal type person uh, into the fold. They're, Those they're, Paul Martin people, man. Yeah, Jesus. they generally. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Come on, new generation. Let's do this. Well, this has been a great listen. I will. I will sign things off. This has been a great, uh, great podcast, Chris. This has been. Uh, uh, this has been fun, and it was. An, it. Uh, I hope uh, David uh, gets his internet connection back, and uh, uh, for next week. All right. Good to see you, Jenny. Take care. Uh, bye, everyone. Hey, Hurley Burleyites, that was weird, getting kicked off of your own show. Um, you might think I was afraid of the we conversation, but I'm not. I'm not afraid of anything. But it was a torrential downpour that out here at the cabin knocked out my internet, kicked me off, as I said, my own show. I want to thank Jenny and Chris, not for just for being so great again this week, but for so ably carrying on in my absence and picking up. It sure made me think of how difficult technically this show is to put on during covid and wanted to give a special thanks to our engineer, Metal Donkers Good, and our producer, Jill Engelman, for all that they do to make this show look and sound as good as possible, given our constraints every week. Uh, we'll have a lot to cover next week. We didn't get to the economy this week, and I really want to talk about that because I think it's going to be the political issue of the next year or so and certainly dominate the next round of elections that we have in this country. So we need to start talking about what some of the implications are of the collapse of... Uh, of the underlying fundamentals of the economy. So we'll get back to that. In the meantime, thank you, Liz Stewart, for coming on and talking about schools, a super important topic. And if you liked what you heard, give us a review or a rating on iTunes um, and uh, or a shout out on social media. And uh, we'll see you next week with another interesting episode. Thanks, folks, for tuning in.